All right, it's week four, lecture three, bioinorganic chemistry with a focus on the x-ray absorption technique. There are several subclasses of this we'll, we'll talk about today. First is x-ray absorption. What, what is the absorption of x-rays? Then x-ray absorption near edge spectroscopy, Zanes. And XAFs, extended x-ray absorption fine structure. I want to make a special thanks to Prof. Van Hoovelen, who prepared some of these slides. Okay, so let's remind ourselves what's happening in electronic absorption. We have a light source that gets sent through a prism to give us uh, distributed light, goes through the sample, into the eye. Ah, the eye! But then we get a spectrum that looks something like this. So we have a plot of absorbance versus wavelength for UV visible spectroscopy. We interpret those absorptions due to ligand to metal charge transfer, so ligand pi orbitals or sigma orbitals absorbing into the empty D, D set. We have D to D transitions, and we can have pi to pi star transitions. So this is all stuff we've seen before, and now let's look in more detail at X-ray absorption. Okay, X-ray absorption, we use high energy X-rays, often from a linear accelerator or a uh, generating synchrotron radiation, which can then be uh, selected for single wavelengths or a variety of energies, going through the sample into the eye again. Do not look at the x-rays. We then get a spectrum that is on energy versus a fluorescence, and we see a, a structure that looks like this. So our job now is to explain what's going on in this spectrum. X-rays are very high energy light, and so we're actually promoting the 1s electrons up into the empty metal d orbitals. That's the pre-edge. It's, it's small features here as we're increasing in absorption. The rising edge is as we take the 1s electrons into empty orbitals that are unoccupied, so sigma star type orbitals. And then finally, the xafs region out here past the edge is where we're taking the 1s electron into the continuum. We've actually removed that electron from the, the atom itself. A really important advantage in this technique is, is that because we're promoting the 1s electrons out of the atom, the energy that we see uh, is, is very, very selective for each element. So you can look at individual elements in a mixture because you're only going to be looking at a certain energy region at a time and you will be able to select out one atom from a, a, a mixture of different atoms. So you could see one iron atom in a protein because you're only going to be looking at the iron region of the spectrum. So the near-edge spectroscopy, this region of the spectrum, sort of before the edge, is telling you information about the metal or the, the element you're looking at. And the main thing that it's telling you is something to do with the oxidation state. So the more uh, oxidized the metal is, the higher oxidation state the metal is, the, the harder it is going to be to remove an electron from that metal. So you can see that in this graph, rubidium metal in the gas phase versus rubidium nitrate. Rubidium nitrate is plus one. We can see this blue curve has shifted to the right to a higher binding energy than the rubidium vapor. So we see peaks in the spectrum due to the relative oxidation state or valence number of the ion in question. This is perhaps more easily seen in this uh, sample of near-edge spectroscopy of a variety of plutonium samples. So there was an unknown uh, sample. that had, They knew it had plutonium in some oxidation state or other. And so they did a plutonium 3, 4, 5, and 6 standard. And we saw these different uh, shapes. And the, uh, the unknown fit pretty well with the plutonium 4. So you can use this as to identify unknowns in a mixture. You can also do a little bit more information. You can, it, the, the main thing is the formal valence of the metal and coordination, geometry, and distortions are best handled by other techniques such as XAFs. Okay, XAFs, extended x-ray absorption fine structure. This is actually an amazing technique. I've never done it myself, but I've been around 
data that was collected on a compound that I was very interested in. So what we can see is that we have an X-ray beam with a ramping of the photon energy. So all of this X-ray absorption we've seen so far has allowed us to have photons of a variety of energies. Um, and above the absorption edge, we saw a dramatic increase in absorption. That's the fact that the curve is going up as you sweep through with the X-rays. Now this sweep implies that we're using synchrotron radiation. We're not just using a, a, a source of just a single energy, but we're sweeping through a, lar a relatively large window of energies. And so that sweep requires pretty specialized light sources. The resulting photoelectrons, and this is the important part of XFs, and I'll point this out on the next page as well, but once you eject those photoelectrons from the core into the continuum, they are quote, barely moving, end quote. So there's a very a relatively low amount of kinetic energy of these electrons, and that allows us to get some additional information, some backscattering, due to the distance, the number, and the type of the atom that is nearby to that electron. So much like X-ray crystallography, we can learn quite a bit of information about the, the exact nearest coordination environment of that metal ion that we're looking at. So that's shown on this slide, which is a yttrium in water. And so we can see that as the electron is ejected from the, the element, it undergoes constructive and destructive interference based on nearby molecules that are present in the solution or present in the environment. So let's think about how we could then uh, interpret this information. So here's a rhodium sample. This is the, uh, the raw data coming out of the absorption. So we see the, the pre-edge, the edge, and then past the edge, we see this relatively featured uh, spectrum. You might expect, you know, if the electron is going into the continuum, it's, it's, it's escaping into the environment, there's not going to be any features here. But these features are because electrons behave as a wave. What we do is we take the Fourier transform of this part of the spectrum, and we see peaks at different radii, uh, and so the, the, this is the spatial domain and this is more of the frequency domain. So we can see these peaks due to rhodium atoms at different distances. The actual work to determine what this data means requires a lot of trial and error and fitting, much like X-ray crystallography, and so I'll try to demonstrate that with uh, a, from a tutorial that I found online. Okay, so this is iron metal. Here we have the raw data, and here is the Fourier transform. The blue here is the, the data, and the red is the fit. And so what they're doing in this, this simulation is showing, all right, let's just look at the, the central red iron, and that iron is surrounded by two, four, six, eight yellow iron atoms. Those eight iron atoms are all equivalent, and those are the closest uh, iron atoms to the central iron. And if you just imagine, you know, eight iron atoms undergoing an interaction with the central iron atom, we would get one peak. And it doesn't do a great job of fitting the blue curve, but it does a good job of fitting that first peak. And so the closest neighbors here are responsible for this part of the XFs data. The second closest path are these blue atoms, which is an octahedral coordination environment around that central red atom, and that gives rise to this shoulder in this first peak. This is the fifth path in iron metal, so the fifth path you're starting to see features out in this region, and this is the eighth path where now we're seeing features out here. So you can see, you know, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, you know, you can begin to really understand the, both the number, so the, free, the height of this peak is re related to the number of atoms that have that environment, and the distance away. And so you can really begin to assemble some good three-dimensional information about the coordination environment of this central atom. Now in iron metal, all of the atoms are identical, so it doesn't matter what our central atom is, but when, we'll do an example next that shows how you can look at different coordination environments uh, around a molybdenum center. 
Okay, here are three molybdenum complexes. So this is a molybdenum-3 with three analyte ligands. This, these are compounds that are very similar to the work that I did as a graduate student that I alluded to earlier in the week when we talked about EPR. So this has three unpaired electrons. Each molybdenum center here is molybdenum-4 with uh, two unpaired electrons, and this is molybdenum-6 with no unpaired electrons. And so you might expect to see in the near-edge spectroscopy a difference in the oxidation state of the molybdenum based on the fact that we have different oxidation states here. It turns out that the, the molybdenum XFs has a fairly broad edge, and so there's not a lot going on there. But this, this pre-edge feature uh, was interpreted in this paper, if you want to read more about it. The Fourier transform, the, the raw, well, not the raw, the, the normalized XFs data and the Fourier transform of that data is shown here for these three compounds again. And there's a lot going on in this slide. I just want to show you that in this compound A, we expect to see three nitrogens that are all at an equivalent distance. And everything out here is carbons, and there are going to be a lot of carbon sort of out here that are relatively featureless. But we see three strong, uh, you know, we see one peak corresponding to three nitrogens. You can actually uh, count the number of, of elements here. It's it, like integrating it. it. Not if there's only one peak, but over here where we can see different peaks. So that's, it's more complicated than NMR, but you can get a, a relative number of different elements. Looking at compound B, we expect to see a nitrogen a slightly farther away nitrogen and a molybdenum. And we see this, the close by nitrogen, the nitrogens that are further away, and then the molybdenum out here. So we can really begin to see a lot of features. And then this compound C, we have three further away nitrogens and then a relatively close triple bonded nitrogen. So we see the triple bonded nitrogen and three nitrogens here. And so the dotted line is the fit to the data. And you can see that we, and I didn't do this, but my graduate advisor and the group at the time did this, we have good fits to the data. You can actually learn a lot about the geometry of a complex too. What we were interested in studying is what is the geometry of that nitrogen bridge species? Is it cis? Is it trans? Is it linear? And uh, the data is strongly supportive of a linear arrangement instead of a cis or a trans arrangement. So the details are beyond what I want you to see, but you can learn not only the relative position and number of scatterers, but also some pretty useful information about the geometry of the scattering uh, atoms. Now, to get a good fit, you have to... Uh, examine a lot of different scattering paths. So this is the fit to the data. In order to get this good of a fit, we had to add all of these different sine waves due to all of these different scattering contributions to the XF's data. So for a real molecule, it gets pretty complicated to see exactly what's going on, but you can imagine, you know, and there are computer programs that do this and help you fit it. And so you can, again, learn what is nearby how many of them are nearby, and what is the relative geometry. So this is not a in-depth introduction to XAFs or X-ray absorption, but I wanted to give you some, some, some things to think about. So the theory of XAFs, we have synchrotron radiation. X-rays are ejecting the core electrons, and we see scattering and interference to nearby scatterers and it requires a, a significant amount of computational work to get a good fit. But we can get metal oxidation state, bond lengths, bond angles, and so we can really learn quite a bit from the technique. Pros and cons of the technique relative to X-ray crystallography. Well, the biggest difficulty in crystallography, especially these days, is getting a crystal. Once you have a crystal, we can mount it and get a structure in a, a day or so, but getting the crystal is difficult. XFs can be done on liquids, glasses, powders. I showed some gaseous data. So it do, you're much less limited in terms of your sample. Anything that you can get, you could do an XFs on. But it does require going to a synchrotron radiation source. We don't happen to have one nearby uh, in the department, so we would have to uh, apply for some beam time and, and do that. So the main advantage of X-ray absorption methods are the insensitivity to the long-range order. We're looking at 
And these, and th these are figures from the, ch the book chapter, which we'll talk about in a second. But we're looking at the nearest neighbors to the central iron atom in the rubidoxin. So we're only looking at what's nearby to that iron, and we don't need long-range order. We don't need a crystal in order to get the information. So we can get the good information from amorphous samples. So we can really learn about the coordination environment of the metal center in question. In the chapter, uh, the book talks about the complementarity of X-ray and XFs, and these, this data was, was, was some of the earliest uh, XFs data, and it actually sort of cemented the technique as being important for not only bioinorganic chemistry, but inorganic chemistry in general. This was the fit to the data with the assumed uh, iron-sulfur bond distances in rubidox, and you can see it's not a very good fit. The X-ray data that they had suggested four different iron-sulfur bond lengths. When they changed all the iron-sulfur bond lengths to be the same, they got this fit, and then they went back, actually, and re-refined the X-ray data using the same iron-sulfur distances and got a better refinement. So it's a complementary technique to X-ray crystallography, and it doesn't require as much good, high-quality crystalline sample as you would need for X-ray crystallography. Our last technique is Mossbauer spectroscopy, so look forward to lecture four on that coming soon.